Hi, everybody. I'm Dennis Prager. This is my home. This is Otto. Say hi, Otto. Oh, Otto's in the other direction today, but I don't want to wake him up because then, uh oh, all's good. All right, go back to sleep. Okay, good man. See, because if I got him up, you'd watch him, not me. I know that. There, I am no competition for Otto. I, Otto gets people looking at him when he's sleeping. So if, if he were awake, I'd be doomed. Anyway, welcome to my home. It is my home. And this is the Fireside Chat. Every week, I get a chance to talk to you completely unscripted. In fact, we decide what my opening comments will be like a, a minute before. I want it to be as spontaneous as possible, as, as real as possible. Then I take uh, your questions. So hi, everybody around the world, literally. Nice to be with you. So Megan, who looks at your questions, and there are thousands of them, she tells me, last we counted from 51 countries, is a lot of people ask, how do I stay happy, maintain my calm, in light of what is happening specifically uh, in America. And what they're referring to is, and the question is completely accurate, I fear for the future of America. And if America fails, the amount of, of cruelty, genocide, like genocide that will take place in the world is, is immeasurable. The United States is uh, the finger in the dike of the flood of evil that would take place in the world were it not for America's strength and commitment to liberty. And it's being undermined for the first time in American history, actually. Th there has never been a, 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 such a battle. So, well, the Civil War in the United States history over slavery might be comparable. And that would be it. This is a very serious danger in America. And then I have to answer the personal part about being happy, maintaining some degree of optimism and so on. These are very real questions. I deal with them. I am terribly worried about the United States and I don't worry much. It's not my nature. In fact, it's my conviction not to worry. My conviction is to do something about it. And of course, that's what I'm trying to do with PragerU and my writings and, and my radio show and, and much more. We are in danger of losing liberty in the United States because the left, not liberals, I always separate between left and liberals, the left has never valued liberty. The left values an ever, ever, ever stronger, bigger state. And the bigger the state, the less the liberty. I mean, that's so obvious that I, yeah, I, I'm a, I'm a, I feel bad that I'd have to explain it. The bigger the, the, the government, the, the state, that means that by big, it means control you. Uh, it, it, this notion of we'll give you free health care, free education, free housing, uh, free student loans, free school lunches, free school breakfasts, that just means that the government is bigger and bigger. It, it's, like, it's sort of like the devil. You make, the, you make a deal. Okay, get, feed me. Take care of me, but then if you take care of me, you own me. The threat to free speech in the United States is unprecedented. That even in the Civil War, there was, there was one thing Americans believed in, and that was you can say what you want even if I hate what you say. But not anymore. This, the, the left is threatening that too. Look at the American universities. Look at British universities, Australian universities. It's not just the United States. Where... Uh, speakers who have conservative ideas have to come with armed guards. When Ben Shapiro spoke at Berkeley, it cost $600,000 that the Berkeley claimed. The University of California at Berkeley cost 600, sp spent $600,000 to guard him. That's absurd. What, what has he ever said that necessitates a guard? The guy should show up on the campus for free. I don't mean get no payment, but I mean with, with no... With no uh, with no guards at all. Well, this is, it's, it's an absurdity. What has he ever said that would necessitate it? But he's an articulate conservative. I get guards when I go to. Not $600,000 worth, thank God, but guards. 
I have a picture of Colorado State University of me with two policemen who look like they are about to enter combat in Afghanistan. Uh, it, it's, it, it actually cracked me up when I met them. I said, you're here to guard me? I mean, uh, you, uh, somebody would need a grenade launcher to be able to attack me with you guys around. Leftists don't need guards on campuses. You ever notice that? And some of them get hurt when they show up. Some of them can't show up. They just scream down. By the way, I have a movie coming out, uh, which uh, I, you'll be able to see around the world, but certainly in theaters in the United States, called No Safe Spaces. It's a, very, it's a great movie, and I don't take credit for it. I'm in it, obviously. Uh, uh, not obviously, but I am in it. I, I, I quote-unquote star in it with Adam Carolla, who is a terrific human being, a brilliant comedian observer of the human condition and but the, I, the people who made the movie get the credit for it being a great movie and it really is it also shows the divide between liberal liberals are for free speech leftists are not we have a lot of liberals in the movie i mean you'll be you you'd quite uh, be shocked so yes i am really really worried the lies told about America, the least racist country in human history, is called racist all the time by the left. It's a magnificent lie. It's like the lie that, that the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. For two years, America was immersed in a lie. The entire American media, with a handful of exceptions, perpetrated this lie. Then nothing, there was, it was found to have zero substance, zero. So they dropped it. Did they apologize? Did they say, gee, we lied to you for two years? No, of course not. They went to the next lie. They live on this stuff. There's always a crisis, always an existential crisis. And it always, the solution is always bigger and bigger government. Did you ever notice that? Is there ever a left-wing crisis for which the solution is not more power to the, to the left, more power to the government? The amount of debt the United States has because of giving away so many things for free. The idea of open borders, that the left stands for open borders. Let's be honest. You come into the United States, you, you not only come in illegally, you're, you, by the way, you can't even be called illegal. There's now a new mantra, no one is illegal. What does that mean, no one is illegal? It's just a demagogic phrase. Some people are in a country illegally. If I sneak into Brazil, I'm, in, um, I'm an, illegal alien, an illegal alien in Brazil. <laughs> Every country has that, or there's no such thing as a country. The, 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 the attack on the fundamentals of America are, are profound. Free, this freedom of speech, the concept of, of un, unlimited numbers of people coming into the United States... Uh, I, I, I do worry. So how do I stay happy? It's actually a challenge. I fully acknowledge it to you, uh, but I have no choice. I try to live by what I preach, okay? And I preach that you have to act happy even if you don't feel it, because it is of no use to you or anybody else if you act unhappy. So I do. I, 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 am, I have a wonderful personal life. I am blessed. And I celebrate my life, but I worry about my society. And I, I live with both factors. I, I fully acknowledge if, if a leftist and all the Democrats running for president wins the next election, uh, I, I, I fear for this country. I truly do. And I, I don't fear easily. The, the fomenting of, of racial... Uh, anger in this country by the left is perhaps its most inexcusable evil. This country is a blessing for blacks, for whites, for Hispanics, for Asians, for men, for women, for gays. This country is a blessing. That is why in Hong Kong, where, where they're demonstrating against uh, China for freedom, uh, many of them march with the American flag. It's not an insult to any other country that they don't pick any other country's flag to march with. America represents liberty. But America may not represent liberty if the Democratic Party, which is now a left-wing party, no longer a liberal party, wins. We won't even represent liberty in the world. So, yeah, uh, 
I can only tell you, therefore, those of you, many of you who have asked, so how do you maintain, if you have this worry, how do you maintain your happiness? You fight. That's what you do. You, you fight. Join me in fighting or help me fight and help the people. As I always say, good people are divided among three groups. Fighters, those who help the fighters, and those who do nothing. Those who do nothing are the biggest of the three groups. Those who help the fighters are just as good as the fighters because the troops can't fight without supplies. So the people who give the supplies are just as important as the troops. But most people don't want to fight or they, or they bury their head in the sand. There are a lot of conservatives in America who deny that this is as serious a problem as I think it is. No, we've had much bigger problems in American history. Some people I really admire have said that. They're wrong. With the exception of the Civil War, this is a civil war. It's not violent. It may, it may be violent. I pray it isn't. But it, it's, it's very serious stuff. The human being does not yearn to be free. The human being yearns to be taken care of. That's why the left is successful all over the world. It doesn't give people freedom. It takes away people's freedom. Every single leftist revolution reduced freedom. Every one. But what they do is they promise they'll take care of you. And the human being rather be taken care of than be free. That's, uh, that's why so many leftists supported the Castro revolution in Cuba. He took care of people. Yeah, there's no freedom there, but so what? There's a 98% literacy rate. Do you know how many leftists have said that? To which I've said my whole life, I'd rather be illiterate and free than literate and, and, and in a communist country. If all I could read is communist party literature, what's the good of reading? I can still read a stop sign if I'm driving. The human condition is the problem, of course, and the human condition is not pretty. This desire to be taken care of rather than be free is a great example. By the way, this is not, this is the human condition, this is not new. That's why I believe in the concept of wisdom, to teach people about the human condition without their having to relive it every generation. That's what the beauty of wisdom is. You get a head start in understanding life if you're, if you're given wisdom. That's why I believe the wisest book ever written is the Bible. That's why I'm writing my commentary on the first five books called The Rational Bible to give all these insights. Give you one example, totally pertinent here. God takes the Israelites out of, out of Egypt where they've been 400 years in bondage. The first thing they do is complain that they want to go back to Egypt because the food was better. That's right, it's in there, just check it out, it's in Exodus. They rather be well-fed slaves than free people living on a boring food called manna in the desert. Amazing, isn't it? That's the human condition. In that sense, unless a slave is beaten, that's uh, it's sort of they get free health care, free room and board. I mean, think about it. There's no difference between a slave and a Soviet citizen. All Soviet citizens were all slaves. They were owned by the state. People are okay with being owned by the state. Very few people want to be free. Free means you're responsible. People don't want to be responsible. They want to be taken care of. The bigger the government, the smaller the citizen. The line I came up with many years ago. It remains true. But to summarize, you still have to be happy and you still have to fight for the good. It's no victory to anybody if you get miserable, right? It's not good for you. It's not good for anyone in your life. You should still be a joy to be around even if you're worried, even worried silly. Okie dokie. That was an important subject. Your questions. So we now have a, 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 a what is this, a tryout period of, of, of I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Of, 
uh, uh, video questions. So if you have a video question, send it to us. Fair enough. Tell us who you are, obviously. That would be fun with given how many countries this is viewed. That would be fun. Hi, I'm so-and-so here in Albania. And maybe it would be fun. How, how could you prove, your, I guess, mm, show some of the books in your house, except not everybody has books anymore. It's so sad. I did a video where I talked about the, the, the beauty of having books in a house. That was a good one. I actually watched a fireside chat. I don't tend to watch me because I'm as, all I do is see errors, which is what everybody does that. That's, that's, you know, you look in the mirror. What, what do you see? How great you look? People see the flaws. Okay. So here's our first video. And here we go. Hi, Dennis. I'm Devin from California. I'm 24 years old, going to be 25. And I have a question for you. My question is, what are your thoughts about moving in before marriage? That's quick and to the point. Hi, Devin. So Devin's now we got we've got to figure out a fun way for people to prove where they are. Maybe in front of a car with a license plate or in front of a flag or a newspaper. But that would be fun. I think people should try to do that. So uh, what do I think about people moving in before marriage? OK, so uh, I, I am not going to give you a religious answer. Uh, I'm going to give you a pragmatic answer. And in fact, I'll give you even a romantic answer. How's that? Pragmatic and romantic. I'm not going to go into the issue of, of religious views on, on sexual behavior. OK, so I'm going to give you a secular response. First is the pragmatic. This will blow many of your minds. It blew my mind when I first learned it. Couples that lived together prior to marriage are more likely to divorce. Completely counterintuitive. I always thought that, hey, it makes sense. How do you really know a person you're thinking of marrying? And that's by living together. And there's some truth to that. Uh, remember my motto, first, tell the truth and give your opinion. People, you have to argue always on the basis of truth and then make your argument. So that seems true. You will get to know somebody well 24-7. Okay. But, so why then do couples that live together before marriage divorce at a greater rate? This is, and this is just data. This is not religious, secular, right-wing, left-wing. It's just data. Once I heard the reason, it made perfect sense. Do you know the reason? Do you know the reason? Exactly. I bet you 99 out of 100 people could not come up with the reason. I couldn't. But once I heard it, just as when you now hear it, it'll make perfect sense. Couples that live together are less likely to break up when there are issues than couples that don't live together. It's hard. It's hard to break up. Otto, Otto, has, uh, that, that affected Otto. Uh, Otto, you really is something. You're the boy, Otto. You are definitely the dog of the week. Okay, shh. Pretty much. So, right? Listen, this makes perfect sense. You, two, couple A is living together. Couple B lives together. Couple A, couple A is living together. Couple B is not living together. Couple A has the same seriousness of problems as couple B. The couple living together as the couple not living together. The couple not living together has certain problems. Okay, I'm sorry. It was, you know, uh, you're a wonderful human being, but uh, we just got, it's, we're not made for each other. But couple A living together, that's very hard to do. It's like a divorce. You, somebody has to pack up and leave. So they don't. <clears throat> so people who live together are, are, will get enter marriage with more problems than people who have not lived together 
<clears throat> Interesting, isn't it? So that's an argument against uh, living together because it's so hard to break up. Uh, here's my romantic argument. And that is, I don't, I'm not sure about this notion you, you get to know the person all that better uh, by living together. Uh, I, I don't know my wife better because we live together than I, I, I knew her really well when we dated. And, and ask any couple. Was there, are there revelations about the person because you now live together? Not really. Okay, may, maybe you know what they do with their socks better than, than you knew before, but that's not on the list of truly significant things. So the, the, the romantic argument is powerful that you go from the wedding to your first night together. That's powerful. Uh, and I don't know why one would would forego that. It's a, if, if you if you're living together, your wedding is like okay. What's on the schedule today? Oh, we're getting married. Okay, that's nice. Whereas it's if we create beauty, we create powerful experiences. Then they're not intrinsically powerful. We create the power of them. So I, I just think that that works out better. So there you go. Uh, Chance, 25, Bakersfield, California, Hello, Mr. Prager. One of my college professors believes in, quote, the concept of whiteness. Your professor is a racist. The only people who believed in the, the, the concept of whiteness prior to this very recent moment in history were Nazis. <laughs> it's really a joke. The concept of whiteness. Your professor's an idiot. And there are so many idiots teaching, it's painful. But he was taught by fools. Where did he come up with it? He, did, he was taught this drivel. What does it mean, the concept of whiteness? Am I white? Yes, I'm white. So why would I have a concept of whiteness? Tell me one concept of whiteness that I share with all whites. Tell me one. If it's a concept, then whites share it, correct? What, <laughs> what, what concept, what value do all whites, do what anything do whites share? Nazis were white and they wiped out uh, my, my group, Jews, who were, who are in Europe at least white. Half the Jews in the world are Arab Jews or or Sephardic Jews, Spanish Jews, they're, they're, they're swarthy complexioned. And they're even black Jews, Ethiopian Jews. So oh, Stalin was white. Do I share? Did he share with me a concept of whiteness? What is he talking about? The left makes up lies and then build theories on it. You don't need to have white skin to be white. What does that mean? So then, so then whiteness is a concept having nothing to do with being white. This is what you're taught at college and you paid to do this? You paid to hear this? <laughs> it's painful. So what is whiteness? If, so a, a black could be white and a white could, could be non-white, correct? No, no, if it's not, if, if, if it's a concept. Why do some people on the left, such as a professor, believe that whiteness is an oppressive and real force while simultaneously decrying racism of any kind? Because he's a leftist and, and there is no rational leftist thought. None. There's rational liberal thought and there's rational conservative thought. There's irrational liberal thought and irrational conservative thought, but all leftist thought is irrational. It is a substitute make-believe religion. It is a secular religion. It is, this is an astonishing thing. What is it? I'd love to know exactly what he means. Give me, ask your professor, and I'll, I'll, I'll take your question. Ask your professor, what, what does that mean? When, when, uh, when he says that there was a concept of whiteness, give me, give me one of those concepts. Okay. 
Danielle, 24, Springfield, Missouri. I'm a Christian who works in writing and illustration. What is your stance on representing gay relationships in my work? Representation of homosexuals is often equated to endorsement of that lifestyle, and my faith does not endorse it. I do not want to betray my beliefs, nor beliefs, nor do I want to discriminate against homosexuals. Okay, I can't speak exactly to your work. I supported the people who, uh, the Christians in America, who did not want to bake a cake for a gay wedding. They totally happy for years. They had been baking cakes for gays. I would be against their decision if they if they said we don't bake a cake for a gay. I would I would be opposed to that. But gay wedding that's a very separate issue. I I don't believe in same sex marriage. I believe only in mar that marriage should be between one man and one woman. That is what I believe. That is correct. But uh, so what? I my but. Uh, uh, we, we have a gay a gay man who, uh, uh, who, with his gay partner or husband, I don't know if they're married, uh, have two kids. He's on the board of directors of PragerU. I, I, my wife and I are godparents to, uh, to, gay, uh, to a gay couple, to their kids. We're, if something happens to them, they want us to be the spiritual advisors, the moral advisors to their children. I mean... Uh, but but and they know I'm against same-sex marriage. Next uh, next Friday night uh, we will have the Sabbath dinner with a gay couple coming over. They got a, you got a different couple than even the ones I just mentioned. But uh, but I, I I I cannot celebrate a gay wedding. That is true. I admit it. And they know it. And they don't hold it against me. They understand. I'm not coming from a place of hate. I'm coming from a place of affirmation of what I believe is the ideal man-woman marriage. That's it. My motto in life is compassion in the micro, standards in the macro. I ought to talk about that once. That's a big one. What's our time frame? 26. Okay. Next. Uh, Phil in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 37 years old. Dennis, what do you think is the single most important thing that couples need to say to one another if they feel like their relationship is falling apart? Uh, they should say, why is it falling apart? That's the most important thing. And they should do it uh, without speaking. They should do it uh, instant message. They should each sit in separate rooms and they should type in their dialogue. That way you're forced to hear clearly what the person says. You are forced to be clear in what you say. Writing is much clearer than speaking for, the, for most people because you can edit. I really believe couples should do that regularly anyway. I am instant message each other. I think it's a very healthy way to communicate with clarity. And, and no one can ever say, well, you said, because there it is. Well, if I said it, where is it? I believe in clarity over agreement. I would like couples if they have a disagreement, the first thing they should do is let's make clear what it is we're disagreeing with. So I need to know what you say. And there's a very good rule that I've heard, and I totally agree with it. I do it on my radio show. I often restate what, what my caller or my guest has said. I will say it in my words to make sure I heard them correctly and then say, am I correctly summarizing your position? and then move on. It's a good thing for, for a couple to do. If you're having any disagreement, let me please say, you got to stay calm. That's, that's key. Or, you, or at least you could, you could start yelling after you've reached clarity. But you have to reach clarity. And uh, uh, look, I have a lot of suggestions on how couples can work things out, but I don't know what's disturbing your, your marriage. But the first thing I would aim for is clarity. And I would do it in writing. I would sit in the thing. So, okay. So, for example, did you love me when we were married? If the answer is no, then there's not much hope. If the answer is yes, there is hope. So, ha what happened? You loved me when we got married. What did I do that, that has uh, made you love me less? Or what didn't I do? I mean, it, it, it might be very helpful. Uh, it might be easier to say, well, the truth is I still love you, though. 
I, I don't want to get a divorce. Uh, by the way, it's not even breakdown of love that leads to divorce. It's usually breakdown of respect. Uh, especially for a woman. A, wo a, a woman, we think of the women as the more romantic sex, but it's not really true. They're romantic in their own ways. Women are more interested in respecting the man they marry than they are even in loving him because they can't love anybody they don't respect. That's this is very, very important for men to understand this. So are you, do you, uh, do you earn your wife's respect? And likewise, does, do you, does he feel he is interested in something slightly different? He wants to know that you love him. Does he have reason to believe that you love him? And uh, he, he may have reasons to think that, that you don't. I formulated it once, I think, very well after decades of talking to thousands of people. I mean, talking to millions, but actually getting feedback from thousands. So I think I put it this way. He wants, he wants to be respected by the woman he loves, and she wants to respect the man she loves. Does that make sense? I think that that's, I think that's the way I formulated it. So that's, uh, but I'm a big fan of sitting in separate rooms and doing it this way. Talking is, look, I talk for a living. I talk, I think, pretty clearly. But I think that that is a very ignored solution to these problems, writing to one another like that. Is that about it? Yeah. What a serious note to end on. Can I find a lighter idea to end on? Leave people in a good mood? <laughs> well, let's see. I'll be back next week. That's a good thing. And I want to thank you for watching because this is very important to me. I want to share a lot of ideas in life so you can have a better life. That's what the reason, that's the whole reason for this. That's a good note to end on. So thanks everybody. I'm Dennis Prager and I'll see you next week. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to keep these fireside chats free, please do by donating to PragerU.